The, the big issue for Biden is trying to make sure that he can get through this huge $3 trillion infrastructure bill. And of course, he's got a very weak position in the Senate. At the same time, he's carrying a lot of flack for the withdrawal from Afghanistan, I think completely correctly. I think that was a catastrophic, unnecessary decision. And people have every reason to be very suspicious of Biden. And finally, I think, Ray, in his foreign policy, it's very difficult to see much difference between his approach and that of Donald Trump. It's a very worrying sense that America is getting increasingly isolationist. I get that impression too. And um, it, it seems odd because just a few years ago, they seemed to be um, leading the way in foreign diplomacy. Yeah, America has such extraordinary strengths. I mean, along with all the criticism that you can make, I feel that there are very few places in the world where you have so many foreign policy experts. You go to Washington, you want to find out about Somalia or South Sudan. There are universities, there are think tanks, there are these incredibly smart staffers working in Congress and the Senate. The US military are incredibly impressive. You know, people will have heard of generals like David Petraeus, Stanley McChrystal, extraordinary people. So it's very sad to see the US at a stage where I think they're very uncertain about their role in the world. Worldwide, what concerns me is there seems to be a lack of really good leadership. Um, and certainly a lack of sensible diplomacy. A lot of, there's a lot of posturing, but I don't see much real practical uh, action. How do you feel about that? No, I agree. And it's, it's very sad. Somehow, something about modern politics doesn't really seem to be about running things. People don't seem to be very interested in governing. It's all about, obviously, for understandable reasons, people focus on getting elected. But one of the things that we're realising is that the skills that it takes to get elected, to appeal to people in an election campaign, are often very damaging in terms of running things well, because it encourages you to be very extreme, very partisan, to sell very simple messages to get elected. And then, of course, the business of politics is very, very complicated. It's about bringing people together, and it's about getting things done. It's like running a pizza business or, or running a, a news company. It's, it's stuff that requires a lot of brains, a lot of effort, and a lot of energy. And we're producing politicians who are not rewarded for their performance, they're rewarded for, for their appearance. And you're teaching politics and diplomacy. So well, what's your attitude to, to leadership? Would you, how do you teach that? Do you teach people that they have to be uh, camera ready? Or do you teach them to actually understand the, the, the fundamental prin principles of leadership? It's very difficult teaching leadership. But what, one of the things we try to do is, is to use role plays. So this week in class, I pretended to be Chris Whitty, and I gave the rest of the class a briefing on COVID, and they played the role of the prime minister. And we spent an hour and a half trying to discuss COVID. The week before, I pretended to be a general, and they played the US president trying to debate the issues on Afghanistan. I think one of the ways for students certainly to learn about political leadership is through role playing, through trying again and again to go through real issues and see the mistakes that we all make. So in a way, you're teaching them to be empathetic. Empathy is the key to everything, Ray, and I think that that's a very, very good word, and it's something that we often seem to be lacking in the world, which is to see see the world as others see it, and, and that's one of the things that makes things seem so black and white. We, we seem to be in a world where everybody's either evil or good, rather than seeing ourselves and other people. Tell me about Afghanistan. How was the withdrawal from Afghanistan received within the U.S.? Of course, the majority of the Afghan, uh, the American people, were very relieved to get out of Afghanistan. But remember that they didn't know much about it. They hadn't been told much about it. So that people believed they were living in a trillion dollar war, that there were 100,000 troops on the ground. The reality is that combat operations finished in 2014. There were only 2,500 American soldiers left. There have been no casualties in 18 months, no British casualties since 2014, it would have been actually surprisingly risk-free, cost-free to stay and prevent the Taliban from taking over. And that's the sad thing, that people have been sold this story by political leaders that they're ending this huge forever war, when the truth of the matter is that quite a small presence could have done a lot of good. And do you think that um, the, the, this sudden withdrawal from Afghanistan has impacted President Biden's uh, domestic policies? Um, I get the impression that uh, the Rep Republicans were much more uh, about seeing the job through. Yeah, it's definitely provided a huge stick for Republicans to be seen with both the decision to withdraw and also the way the withdrawal was done, the terrible chaos at the airport, the real problems of doing the evacuation. 
I think America is now moving on. The big challenge is, are they going to provide any humanitarian development support to the 40 million Afghans that are still trapped inside Afghanistan, yeah. where starvation is now on its way, there's no money going into charities or UN agencies, the schools are shutting the schools, the clinics are shutting. It was hardly honourable to abandon the loyal Afghans who, who helped us to help them. I couldn't agree more. I think it's a, a terrible, terrible betrayal. We created the United States, its allies over 20 years, a country that was deeply dependent on the West. We encouraged the development of a democracy. We created a military that was dependent on American air power. And then we cut all that off, removed the money that kept the budget going, disabled the Afghan Air Force, and left. And uh, it's, it's heartbreaking, heartbreaking, because Yes, of course, there were Afghans who supported the Taliban, but there were millions of Afghans whose lives have been getting better over 20 years. Women going to school, young men starting businesses, and all of that has been destroyed overnight. It's, it's on its way again to being one of the very poorest countries in the world. So what do you think the future holds for Afghanistan? Well, it partly depends what the internationals decide to do. I think if America and Britain and other international countries continue to provide some degree of support, Afghan lives will be able to hopefully not get too much worse too quickly. But the likelihood is that within a few years, we're going to be looking at an Afghanistan which is very fragile on the verge of civil war. There are terrorist groups now acting freely. So just 36 hours ago, there was a huge bomb in a place called Kunduz in a Shia mosque done by the Islamic State, which is now operating freely in Afghanistan. So I'm very, very worried. I'm very worried about what that will mean for the region, instability of the region, for refugees, for terrorism, but above all, for Afghan people themselves who are going to be suffering terribly. When I first saw that country 20 years ago, one in five children were dying before the age of five. And if we don't support the clinics and the health system, I'm afraid that's the direction we're going to go back pretty quickly. Looking at Afghanistan, it, we, we're, it's mysterious to us. I remember reading uh, Canadian newspapers at the, the height of the Afghan campaign, and the readers were well informed about the names of the warlords, the geography and layout of the country. And we have none of that in our press here. Is, is this something that we're failing to understand about Afghanistan and its people? Yes, I think there's many things we've got to understand. And at that point about media is very interesting. You're quite right. The Canadian US media was much better at giving that kind of detail. The first thing that we fail to understand is, of course, that it is a country which is divided into 20,000 villages. It's very ethnically divided. So people in northern Afghanistan speak a completely different language from people in southern Afghanistan. They can't understand each other. They speak Tajik language in the north and it's Pushtu language in the south. But we also don't understand how much it's modernized over the last 20 years. That when I first saw Kabul 20 years ago, 300,000 people in the city, there are now nearly 6 million. And people are living lives much more similar to middle class people in India. Everyone's got a telephone. 20 years ago, nobody had a phone at all. There's no electricity between Hamas and Kabul. So it's, the change is just extraordinary. In some ways, of course, Afghanistan has gone from something that feels in some ways like an early medieval state to a really modern Asian country. And then because the Taliban has just taken over again, it's crashed back. And, and what is the chance that um, a malign terrorist organization will get a toehold in Afghanistan and, and use it to launch um, attacks on the West? Well, there is, of course, a good chance because the Taliban took power by working with terrorist organizations like Al Qaeda. They've put the Haqqani network, they've given them jobs in the cabinet. They are a jihadi organization. This is their, their history, this is their ideology, this is their links. Now, they have a difficult balance. They're not going to want to initially provide safe haven for terrorist groups because they're dependent on international support. But as they get poorer and as they get in more trouble, they will be threatened by those terrorist groups. It's going to be difficult for them to clamp down on them. And some of these groups they don't control, like... ISIS for a son, which just did this huge bomb 36 hours ago. And given the recent history, what is the chance that Britain will be able to establish a working relationship with the Taliban in the future? We sent a senior diplomat called Simon Gass to Afghanistan just two days ago, and he had meetings with the senior Taliban leadership. It's not a diplomatic relationship, but we're beginning to have conversations as we should be having conversations. And there's, there's a picture of Simon meeting the, the Taliban leadership.
It's going to be very tough, though. We disagree on almost everything. And, uh, of course, the Taliban have just won. It's very difficult to imagine them compromising. I know that building very, very well, which you see the photograph there off on your screen. In fact, I worked with Afghan craftspeople who helped to create the objects in that room. That was the, in the presidential palace. And it's very, very strange to see these people who were our enemies for 20 years. And some of those people are, you're looking at photographs of people who were in Guantanamo Bay, who were in prison in Pakistan. Uh, one of those people was uh, has a $5 million bounty on his head, and he's in the Afghan cabinet. So you know, that, that picture tells you a lot. Rory, it's, it's so nice to talk to you and to, to get your take on Afghanistan. Your knowledge is quite exceptional. Um, what I'm wondering is, are we likely to see you return to British politics? Ray, I, I don't know. I, I love Britain. I, it was a real privilege to be a... I was a MP for, the, for Cumbria, the North Lake District, and that, that was a great privilege. And I loved being prisons minister. I was responsible for the prisons in England and Wales. And I, I love being able to work to try to improve our prison system. But politics is a very, very strange business. So I think you were just discussing this with your previous guests. And uh, going through the business, I put my family through 10 years of this, and it's pretty brutal. I'm, I definitely am not as fit or as sane a person as I was before I went into politics. It has a big, Rory, big pressure on your soul, your brain, your mind. I can. Uh, so I think uh, I'd love to help. I'd love to serve in public service, but I'm going to have to have a pretty serious conversation with my family before I put them through that again. Well, that, that's an honest and fair answer. Rory, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, that's greatly appreciated. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.